am I ever going to get to answering this question in any kind of way that says, read this, read that? We may have to save that for dialogue. We may have to actually take a text and say, let's work our way through what we can do with this. I look at a lot of the early role-playing games, particularly anything before the mid-80s, and having verified this enough with the actual people in enough cases, certainly not all of them, I can see in many cases those inclinations powerfully coming to the fore in the texts, often trying to, in opposition, for example, to other authors in the same game line or even in the same product. That happened. That's really characteristic of the texts of role playing. The purposes are powerful, but they're all like log jammed because of the different people working on them um, and the nature of what was happening in terms of what the, the culture was demanding or insisting that role playing must be, which was, again, very much in flux up until about the mid 80s. So, therefore, the manuscripts and the products, which are very amateurish, which is a good thing because they're raw and therefore more expressive. Um, they all reflect that. They all they are all evidence of this, I think. And I am reasonably certain that I have confirmed enough to say firmly. So we can have those dialogues later. All right. That's the best as I can do with that one. You keep throwing me like the, the deep stuff, right? Is everything so deep? I mean, come on. We're, does anyone ask any, like, you know, sensible questions along the way here? Um, let's see here. We've got Jesse asking about Sperno, which is a fine thing to be asking about, and I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Jesse says it has to do with Sperno scenes, mostly ending them. I figured out how to do it as a list. Okay. Here we go. There are several variables. One is whether you, a player, are one of the two principal players. Because Spiona is a game built for a lot of people. I actually don't like playing it with less than five. And I greatly prefer six to ten. And two, and only two, will be playing principals. Or are responsible for the principals. Um... No principle is not a synonym for player character. All right? It has a meaning in Spiona. But let's just work with this for now. Um, so here is an interesting point. That, okay, so that's the variable, the distinction between those people, right? You are or are not doing that. Here's another distinction about whether uh, a given principle has found themselves in play or not yet. So either starting at the beginning of play or starting from the beginning of uh, just after a flashpoint sequence, um, maneuvers begin. Maneuvers begin with a person who does not play a spy, does not play a principal, and who is uh, therefore in, and is designated by having, you know, holding an ace card or is called the ace. So that person will begin maneuvers. Given the options in the text. They cannot do anything, and I mean they can do nothing, except place one of the principles into some playable situation. You are here. This is happening. All right. So, by definition, when it comes to your turn, you will have at least one principle in a situation, possibly two, um, and you uh, are or are not playing a principal. And remember, a principal player is not starting maneuvers ever. So that's the, the notion of how they begin. When it comes to you, either you can develop the, the, the principal that's already in that situation, um, developing that situation, the, the, certain, the circumstances that they're in, or you can put you know the other principal into a situation. When it comes to you, your principal is not in a situation yet, potentially, then uh, you, can, you can be the person who does that. Um, so the, the critical point here is that we don't, never have to really worry about the situationless, you know, the seamless spy. 
somebody's going to do it. And if it comes to you and you want it to be you, then you can. Um, in fact, I even think that if it comes to you and it hasn't been done yet, that you actually have to do it. So I can look that up, but I think so. Now, the other important issue about this, which Jesse is concerned with, is jump cuts um, and ending scenes. Okay, those are two slightly different things. First of all, the, the nature of the game is such that once you're in these circumstances, it will develop to flashpoint. Now, how does that relate to the fictional concept of scenes, which is a change in time and location? That's very soft in Spion. In fact, I kind of loathe the whole scene vocabulary, um, which is there to a small extent in the text because it was on everybody's mind, but in retrospect, I think I would like to specify that the circumstances of the spy, as they develop through maneuvers, can actually go to, I mean, he can get in a car and go somewhere, right? There could be some time lapse. We should permit that to occur through the process of maneuvers so that the immediate circumstances, just because the spy is like standing there in their, you know, their apartment in Berlin and, you know, the phone rings in the beginning of the maneuvers doesn't mean that flashpoint has to occur while they're talking on the phone. Things can happen. Let that develop. So just go ahead and, and let that develop. It should be important that you are not running into any smash cuts. There is a, uh, during this maneuvers process, there is... Uh, somewhere in there, I was hunting for it, but in there, there is a bit of a veto that, there is a veto that, that if someone who's not you and you are playing the principal actually has them say and do something that you really just, you just no, that's not going to happen. You, you can just like red flag that. Like, don't do that. Um, and that would apply to, well, then you go here. Oh, I do. No, I don't. That person is probably better off seeing the red flag and saying, oh, and then just say, well, okay, it's raining, and let it go on to the next person. Um, the idea here, too, is what a lot of people don't grasp, is how fast your transition of your speaking and maneuvers should be. It's really fast. I mean, you, it comes to you, say a thing or two, move on. Let, you know, let the, next, you know, the next person to your left go. It really isn't this sort of, okay, I've been landed with this. Okay, where's the conflict? I've got to like develop. I've got to develop. I've got to, you know, and be sort of like, oh, I'm, I'm an author now. I've, I got to, very tense, very tense. No fun for Spion. Best off just to say, you know, the steering wheel is hot under your hands because the sun's been, you know, baking it all day. Let the next person go. Um, or work, and again, work with what has been stated. So if that person or somebody has said, you know, well, I, I, I think you're going to the zoo. And, you know, there's no red flag. Of course I'm going to the zoo, right? And then, okay. I can say, okay, at the zoo. I'm the next person. At the zoo, you know, you're in front of the hippo. See, work with what you got. This whole, fr this whole frantic notion of mining for conflict or smash cutting to a new thing and abandoning whatever was going on over there. Okay, it's my turn now. This is really toxic shit. I mean, it's really not worthwhile, not just in this game, but it is a horrible bad habit, which I think everybody should be dialing down a lot. So, scenes during maneuvers shift of location and time should be soft, easy, perhaps extensive. Perhaps it doesn't happen at all. Chill about that. Know where the authorities are. If you're not playing a principal, work with what they've said and done so that what you say, they say and do, if you do, as opposed to someone else, is non-problematic. This whole idea of trying to swerve, you know, the principal player. I'm going to swerve you. I'm going to get you. What are you going to do now? Ugh. 
the game's content takes care of that very nicely. Embracing that game's content, I mean, it's all right there in front of you on the page, just on the pages on the table. You just don't have to do that. Maybe I'm getting off into the weeds here. Um, let's go back to procedures. Um, he says, uh, can I jump cut a spy out of whatever scene they were into some new scene? Well, no. Can you go to some new time or location? Sure. You see the difference? You were talking about like a smash cut, right? Well, he's doing this and he's doing that. And it's like, bam, no, you're not. It's next Thursday. No, that's bullshit. And no, you can't. You can only continue the maneuvers. If continuing the maneuvers includes a very sensible shift of scene of, of, of location and time, then it does. But you're still in the same maneuvers. You see, that you're working with all sorts of dynamics that we know are in play. The difference is enormous. I mean, it's black and white. There is no gray area there. Um, so that that's this, okay? Now, what about if you... If I'm running a spy, can I jump cut either my own spy or the other spy from whatever scene they were into some new scene? Again, this whole scene cut thing is just not working out in this conversation. You've got to drop that, okay? Just, I could say, well, yeah, shift in time and location is okay. But you know what? I think that's getting so wrapped up with the notion of these smash cuts to that abandon what was going on to, haha, now you're here. Do you see the difference? A shift in time and location that follows from what's happening versus, you know, a sudden, you know, hammer in your face. Soft, yes, hard, no. But that doesn't have much to do with extent, does it? It has to do with content. All right, now... Bear in mind that maneuvers are not about ending scenes. This whole notion of ending scene, and that's the scene, is not a phrase that should ever be in. It should be on it. It's not in the book. It's not in the procedures. And it should not be in play. They end in flashpoints. Where that flashpoint takes place is a matter of where the maneuvers have brought us. When they take place relative to the last maneuver bit we saw is a matter of content. Not this whole... And that's the scene. Nobody in Spiona ever says, snip, scene ends. It's not part of play. Does that mean they can't go to new locations and time storing maneuvers? Of course they can. Let it up flow. There's no need for a stop. So, there is one particular place where some of that is harder to grasp and that would be starting new maneuvers after a flashpoint sequence has occurred because the person holding the ace really is actually in kind of you know a driver's seat situation where do we come up upon this particular spy in this case shifts in time and location are frequent understandably But I do think that they should not be overriding what the principal player uh, would say or do that their character would say that their character has said and done. There was one sequence of play in which the flashpoint actually brought this particular person to being uh, 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 basically co-opted by a spy agency and the person who picked it up in maneuvers wanted this principal to suddenly be all the way on the other side of the wall deep in the other part of berlin and the player was kind of pissed and was like there was stuff i you know there's stuff i wanted to do you know with the, the after that interaction and that's fair that's fair i mean the principal players should go okay too far you know let's back it up to to some other place and I think that's actually a good thing. Text isn't as clear about that as it could be, but if, if you juxtapose the business about the player, you know, having a certain amount of moderator power there and the principal player being responsible for starting things up, you know, what's the conflict between those two? 
procedures. Let's make sure there isn't a conflict between those two procedures. It's doable. Just get away from this idea of these humongous surprise cuts and the close. Okay, fade to black. So the next person in maneuvers has to, you know, say, oh, well, shit, I guess we got to fade up on something now. That's terrible play. Work with what's happening. Let changes in time and location be soft and very, very sensible based on what just happened. Let maneuvers turn into flashpoints. Stop editing. That's what I have to say about this. Let me know if I've missed some of the details of what you were asking about. Okay. Um, let's see here. Lova asks about Dungeons and Dragons. As written by the book says, Gary Gygax and Eric Holmes and the culture has taught us is primarily a product of Holmes. The original adult fantasy role-playing game for three or more players. Boy, language has changed, hasn't it? Well, um, I do remember. I mean, I was calling bookstores. This is back when we used these phones to find things. And um, there's all these bookstores all over Chicago. And some of them, amazingly, I had not visited yet. And I was calling around. This is in the 80s later than this, but calling around saying, just to find out what kind of bookstores they are. And I found one called The Fantasy Store. And uh, and I said, well, that sounds promising. Let's uh, let's call that place. And I said, such and such an address, I could go there. But let's call it. Let's find out what sort of store it is. Sure enough, it wasn't what I was looking for. So anyway, yes, the original adult fantasy role-playing game. Um, but uh, anyway, so it is, however, deliberately built for playing with kids. Um, Holmes was, was fairly clear on that. So a little context there, just enjoying the language on the box. So Holmes is one of the games that has occupied my thoughts for a while now. That's a good thing. I'm troubled because I'm not sure what to expect outside of a quite, very quite specific set of actions and roles related to dungeon exploration and combat. For example, instead of a perception ability, there's a specific mechanic that only adjudicates surprise and one for listening at doors and one for triggering but not noticing traps, etc. So yeah, all the rules are about basically being in the dungeon. My questions. Have you played Holmes in social contexts and with other kinds of conflicts, not combat outside of a dungeon? No. I have not. Not really that interested in doing so. Even with intra-party conflicts, and I suppose that can be outside or inside a dungeon. And, well, that's a good question. Um, in the last time I played, people definitely had different ideas about what to do. But it's not like they were hacking at each other with their swords or casting sleep spells upon one another. They, they had other problems at the moment. Um, so, yes-ish, but not perhaps to the extent that you're asking. If so... If -ish. Did the group introduce characteristic ability roles or was the mechanics in the book enough for real bouncy play in those contexts? And I suppose that also includes the out of, out of dungeon question two, characteristic ability roles. First of all, no, we never introduced characteristic or ability roles. And if somebody had suggested doing so as the dungeon master at the moment and the owner of the box, I would have said, forget it. That is not part of the system. In that game, I think it is quite straightforward that somebody has the job to adjudicate such situations um, and on what basis is something they also decide how to do, in my opinion. Should they do so in a way that, you know, is at least understandable, then that's the way they should do it. Um... How much did the reaction table impact play? 
Did you effectively use the reaction table in Holmes like you designed to use charm rolls in Circle of Hands? Was Holmes the inspiration even? Okay, that's pretty densely packed. Let's back up a little bit. Um, I do recall using reaction rolls in terms of whether, you know, the, the cultists or dwarves or whatever they were, you know, ran off in the middle of the fight um, or other things of that kind. I mean, basically just as a, as a fight mechanic. Um, I never used it, well, upon initial encounter, then yes, that's part of the system as well. But in terms of Circle of Hands, which is a vastly more social and slow-paced circumstance for those charm rolls, I don't see much similarity at all. And although, um, I mean, certainly the charm roll in Circle of Hands probably has reasonably identifiable roots in the old reaction rolls, I think those roots have a lot of steps in between. Um, and the fact that it can be very different per player character and is intended to be, um, that doesn't quite match. Um, I would probably find the direct roots for Circle of Hands in some other games. Um, arguably, Charismatic Interactions in RuneQuest, maybe? Or in uh, the fantasy trick where charisma is a trait you can acquire um, that has specific things so that people respond differently to you than they do to some of the other people in the group. That's kind of probably where I would go, where it's an individualized thing. 